Hey everybody, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. We're constantly updating it with new content and never seen before content. So if you want to get the latest from Harvest, hit the subscribe button. John 14, Matthew 14, the title of my message is God's Answer to Fear, Worry, and Anxiety. Before I start, I wanna make sure I'm talking to the right people. <laughs> How many of you deal with fear, anxiety, and worry? Raise your hand up, okay. How many of you don't? You don't have any issues, you're just always calm, and because you're liars, if you're, or, or you're mentally disturbed, or I don't know what you are, but you're not normal, that's for sure. Why is it three o'clock in the morning? is the moment that many of us wake up, at least it is for me, three o'clock in the morning, it's like a magic number. And all of a sudden I'm awakened by a dream or something or some fear, some anxiety, some worry sort of grips me. And then you start playing that what if game. You know what I'm talking about? Oh no, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And all of a sudden you find yourself filled with deep fear, intense worry, and crippling anxiety. Well, that's what I wanna talk about in this little series I'm gonna do on God's answer to fear, worry, and anxiety. You know, when a child is afraid of the dark, they need someone to reassure them. And the best thing to do is turn on the lights so they know there's actually not a monster under the bed, that there is no boogeyman, there is no threat to them. They need the reassuring words of an adult that can help them get a proper perspective. Well, in the same way, like little children, when we're frightened, when we're scared, we need the reassuring words of our heavenly Father to help us in times of anxiety. And you know, we all deal with fear. What I'm amazed by is how, if there's not enough to be afraid of, we pay money to be frightened, right? Oh, the new scary movie, oh, it's really scary. And then the scariest scene of the scariest movie comes on and what do we do? We cover our eyes. How many of you have seen the film Jaws? Jaws, it's been around forever anyway. I, it's hard for you to believe now, but back when that movie came out, people were freaking out in movie theaters. No one wanted to go in the water. People didn't even want to take baths after they saw Jaws. And there's this one scene where the captain uh, of the little boat is swallowed alive by the shark. Now, when you look at it now, it is so fake looking. It's like the fakest shark ever. But somehow, when I saw that scene for the first time, I was like, oh, it's horrifying, you know. So there's scary movies and then there's amusement parks and these crazy roller coasters people can get on. Uh, I just decided a while ago, I'm, I'm not going on another roller coaster. I don't know if I ever enjoyed it. Even when I was a kid, I went to Disneyland not long ago with my son Jonathan and Levi Lesko. And uh, we brought along some of the little kids. Levi brought his daughter Daisy and Jonathan brought Allie and Christopher. And so we're talking about rides that go on and they decided they wanted to go on the new Guardians of the Galaxy ride over at California Adventure. Now I, I've been on that ride. It used to be called the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. And I hated it because I hate to drop quickly. So I'd already done it. I said, I, I'm not going. So Christopher and Levi, and of all people, um, excuse me, uh, Jonathan and Levi and Christopher, little Christopher went on this ride and I took the little girls over to Mater's Junkyard Jamboree. <laughs> and even that nauseated me a little bit. There was a lot of swing in there and a lot of hearing Mater's voice saying, get her done, get her done, right? And by the way, the guy that is the voice of Mater, Larry the Cable Guy, is a Christian who uh, is, uh, listens to our radio broadcast all the time. So anyway, uh, so I've decided I'm tired of paying money to be sick to my stomach and to be scared. But then there are things that really are frightening in life. I heard the story of a hitchhiker, a man in a pickup stopped for him and the hitchhiker jumped in the back. And as it turns out, the man driving the truck had a coffin in the back that he was delivering. So the hitchhiker was sitting there and it started to rain and he didn't want to get wet. So he climbed in the coffin and the hum of the engine caused him to fall asleep. Well, unbeknownst to him, the a truck driver stopped and picked up two more hitchhikers. So they climbed in the back of the truck and they're cruising along and then the rain stopped and the guy had fallen asleep, opened up the top of the coffin and sat up 
The other guys jumped out, needless to say. Now that's scary, that's scary. But so there's a place for rational fear and that we actually want to have that fear. Like if you're in the edge of a, of a cliff, it's good to have fear and step back a little bit. I'm not talking about rational fear. I'm talking about irrational fear that gnaws at us over time. The fear of the unknown, the fear of losing something we have, the fear of losing control, the fear of the future. And there's a lot of things that stress us out. And one of the reasons is because we get our information on demand now so quickly. There's threats of war. We open up the newspaper. Well, very few people read newspapers anymore. You go to your favorite news site or your news feed on your phone or on Twitter and you're reading the headlines, you're scrolling through and oh wow, we might have a conflict with Iran. Oh, there's a terrorism threat over here, another terrorist attack in another place and all those things. And then there's the personal things we worry about. Losing our health, losing our job, even worse, losing a member of our family. And this is not limited to older people. When you're young, you worry all the time. You worry about your future. You wonder, will I ever get married? I'm so old. I'm like 20 and I'm not married yet. Or am I ever gonna pay off my college debt? Or am I gonna have a career? What will it be like to be an adult? And then when you're an adult, you look back in your childhood and say, man, I wish I was young again. Those were the good old days. I didn't have a worry in the world, right? And I actually read the other day that millennials are the most stressed generation ever. That's interesting. The most stressed generation ever. They say they're even more stressed than what is called the greatest generation. That's a generation that came through World War II. And I think there's a two-word answer to why millennials are stressed. Avocado toast. You know, <laughs> there's something in it. It's messing with your minds. Just stop. I actually read a, a headline. A millionaire gave advice to millennials. He said, Stop buying avocado toast if you ever want to buy a house, right? No, seriously, the, the stress is caused clearly by these things that we all have. How many of you have a cell phone? Yeah, how many of you? Every, most of you, yeah. Okay, how many of you don't have a cell phone? You might be the smart ones, you know? Because, the, oh, my flashlight's on. How about that? Look at that. Okay. But, uh, you know, we carry these things around. And I was very excited when this technology uh, came to be because I'm old enough to remember when the first cell phones came out and they were very large. They were called the brick and they were made by Motorola and they really were like a brick. They were massive. They had a battery life of like eight minutes. Uh, but yet we were so excited to be able to carry a phone around. But now these phones are causing so much stress. Uh, they've said that the most stressed people are called constant checkers. These are people who are attached to these devices, just flipping from one screen to another. You've seen people do this. You might even be one of these people. You come to a light, you reach impulsively for your cell phone, and you just start flipping, flipping, flipping. Instagram, uh, you know, what, looking at what's going on over in Twitter, your news feed, uh, checking your emails or whatever it is. And they say that these constant checkers report feeling isolated because of technology even when they're with their families. It's been said that millennials are the loneliest generation of all. You know, I saw an interesting trending term right now. It's hashtag social media didn't exist. Excuse me, if social media didn't exist. Interesting question. What if there was no social media? So of course we go to social media to talk about what it would be like if there was no social media. So I'm reading what people wrote. One person wrote, if social media didn't exist, everyone would be so much happier. And I think there's some truth to that. Because I remember what it was like to not have it. And it was, you know, we had things called answering machines. And when you got home, you'd turn it on and you'd hear all of the messages for the day. But the rest of the time, in some ways, ignorance could be bliss. Another person said, well, we would have a lot more productive people. Another person said we would have to make friends the old-fashioned way. A girl named Veronica said if social media didn't exist, people wouldn't be constantly comparing themselves to guys or girls they see in their feed, which the majority of time are people who have been photoshopped. That's very true. I wish I could look like them, you say. They don't even look like them, you see. It's sort of an illusion. 
Another person said, I have social media didn't exist. I'd have to drag my cat from door to door to show people the funny stuff he does. I, I, I like that. What is with all these videos and pictures of cats? I don't understand it. So I had to jump into the fray and I wrote, if social media didn't exist, I would have more time to be more productive, but at the same time, I would not be able to offer hope from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ to many that really need it. And that's what I try to do with my social media platform. But now it's become lethal. We have death by selfies. I just heard like an hour ago uh, about a young university student, 22 years old, fell off a mountain uh, after she stepped over a retaining wall to take a selfie. A daredevil in China was filming himself hanging off the side of a building, had a camera set up at a distance, and fell 62 stories. A young lady who liked to take selfies of herself on snow-covered mountains in her bikini continued to do so until she fell to her death. And so some of you are saying, you know, I actually was very happy after that time of worship but you've so stressed me out with everything you've said. Well, look, stress is a serious problem which is connected to worry and anxiety because the National Institute of Mental Health reports a significant increase in the number of Americans who fears have moved into full-blown anxiety, disorders, and phobias. Now we've all heard of claustrophobia, the fear of small spaces, but there's other phobias, and these are real. I'm not making any of them up. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this one right. Cathisnophobia. It's the fear of sitting. I hope you don't have that phobia because you're sitting. Even worse, ablutophobia, the fear of bathing. I hope you're not sitting next to someone that has that fear. <laughs> this one I almost understand. Dentophobia. I'm sure you can figure that out. What do you think that's the fear of? Dentists. I don't like the sound of those drills. I was at my dentist the other day and they're doing a teeth cleaning. And, and I don't like it because they're looking for trouble, you know? And then, oh, oh, we have a little problem here. And then she calls it down, here we go, you know? And, and of course it was something that needs to be dealt with, but I'm not dealing with it because I have dentophobia. No, I'll get to it eventually. I have procrastinatophobia too, I think. There's automaton phobia. I'm not making this up. Automaton phobia, the fear of ventriloquist dummies. When would this fear be experienced exactly? I can't think of many ventriloquist dummies I come into contact with. I hope you don't have this one, paldophobia. It's the fear of baldness and bald people. <laughs> but my favorite is phobophobia. That's the fear of phobias. Here's another one, glossophobia. It's the fear of public speaking. That is the number one fear. Number two is death. So basically what you're saying, uh, if you go to a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than saying a few words about the deceased, right? So all these things can lead to high levels of stress. Literally uh, being filled with anxiety and fear can cause you to have ulcers, depression, obesity, nervous breakdowns, even cancer. Uh, one expert said that 80%, excuse me, 90% of all doctor visits in the USA are triggered by stress-related illness. Okay, so what's the answer? Well, as always, the Bible has answers, doesn't it? So let's read some words from Scripture. John chapter 14, a very familiar passage, one that I really love. Uh, Jesus says, and let's get the context of who he was saying it to. Uh, he said this to his disciples in the upper room. Uh, this is after it had become known to them that he was going to be crucified. That he was going to be leaving them. So needless to say, they were very stressed. They were filled with fear and deep anxiety. So with that backdrop, Jesus says these words, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you know. And you may be there also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. We'll stop there. 
The word that Jesus uses here for troubled is a picturesque word. It means don't let your heart shudder. Have you ever had your heart shudder? Just really bad news? Something that just was a shock to your nervous system? He says, don't let your heart shudder. Jesus did not say, worry and get super stressed and mull over your problems. Rather, he said, don't be troubled. And hey, life is full of troubles. No matter how much money you make or where you live or, or what you do for a living, you'll never be able to create a trouble-free life. Uh, Job says in chapter 5, verse 7, people are born for trouble as readily as sparks fly up from a fire. I hate to break it to you, but it's always going to be something. It's always going to be something. Just when you get through that one conflict or that one difficulty or that one hardship or that one trial, hey, another one's coming. I don't say that to depress you. I say that to prepare you. So you understand that troubles may come and what you need to do when those troubles do come. There's big things that seem to overtake us and there's small irritating things. But know this, while there are reasons to be troubled, there's a greater reason not to be. Jesus says in verse 10 from the New Living Translation, trust in God, trust also in me. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, I haven't brought you this far to abandon you now. I know what I'm doing. So I'm asking you to believe. I'm asking you to trust me. Here's something to consider. When I don't understand what is happening, fall back in what I do understand. Let me say that again and direct it toward you. When you don't understand what is happening, fall back in what you do understand. So what don't you understand? Well, whatever it is you're facing, whatever hardship, difficulty. Why, 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 we ask. Okay, fall back on what you do understand. What do I know? Well, if I'm a Christian, I know my sin is forgiven, right? If I'm a Christian, I know that one day I'll go to heaven. If I'm a Christian, I know that God is in control of my life. And if I'm a Christian, I know that God loves me. And if I'm a believer, I know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So though I don't understand these circumstances, I'm going to fall back now on what I do understand. And I have found that when those what if questions start rolling through your mind, I like to go back to what I do understand, what I know is true. So here's something to consider. I love this little verse. So much packed into one verse of scripture. Luke 12, 32. Jesus said, fear not little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. We learn a lot from that verse. Number one, fear not little flock. So my point is this, God is our shepherd and we are a sheep. You know, I, I don't know how much you know about sheep. I don't know a lot about them, but I've read some things and I've held them occasionally, but I'm not real familiar with them. But I know they're basically pretty defenseless creatures. Uh, sheep don't bite. Sheep can't run very fast. Sheep don't even have claws. Honestly, a cat has more going on than the sheep does. Uh, we have this little cat that walks around our neighborhood. I actually like this cat. He's like the exception to cats for me because he's just kind of his own little cat. And he was standing in the middle of the street. Who does this? This cat's like, I'm going to sit here. And I don't care. Everyone go around me. He's just sitting there. And a dog is yapping at him and kind of coming toward him. He's just like, come on, bring it on. You know? I thought, I like that cat. Cats have more going on than sheep because at least a cat can claw or a cat can climb a tree and run. But sheep, they're just like leg of lamb for the taking. They ought to just carry mint sauce around with them. Like, here I am. Eat me now, I'm delicious. Yeah, that's what a sheep is. A sheep is totally dependent on its shepherd. Why? Let's be uh, kind and just put it this way delicately. They're really stupid. Um, they run in flocks. They do what the other sheep do. They're easily frightened. They're skittish. And uh, there have been more than one occasion where one sheep goes off a cliff and the other sheep follow him off the cliff. So... No wonder the Bible says all oh, we like sheep have gone astray. Big picture, you're defenseless. Big picture, you can't really defend yourself ultimately. You need the shepherd's care. That's why David was sitting around 
one day when he probably wrote Psalm 23, and you know, he was a musician as well as a warrior and ultimately a king. And he's maybe just kind of, you know, strumming some chords, G, C, D, looking around. He's looking at his flock and he's saying, you know what? These sheep are dependent on me. And the Lord, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He prepares a table uh, for me in the presence of my enemies. And my cup runs over and Yea, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because he's with me. That was the picture he was painting for us, that just as those sheep need me, I need God. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God is our shepherd, and we are a sheep. Number two, God is our Father who loves us and cares for us. Notice he says, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So why should I not be afraid? Because he is my shepherd watching over me, but he's also my Father caring for me. And I can approach him at any time with whatever is troubling me, and he will listen. But not everybody can call God Father. People will say today, well, I believe in the brotherhood of man and we're all children of God, sons and daughters of God. Actually, that's not true at all. We're not all children of God. We're all created by God. We're all made in the image of God. And we're all separated from God by our sin. But the only way to become a child of God is you must be adopted into the family. And the Bible says, for as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. But once you believe in Jesus, you can call God Father. After Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he appeared to Mary Magdalene at the garden tomb, or at the empty tomb, I should say. Something it is the garden tomb in Israel. But uh, there at the tomb, Jesus speaks to Mary and, and he says to her, don't cling to me. Some translations put it, don't touch me. But I think she was holding on to him so tightly. And he says, for I have not yet ascended to my God and to your God and to my Father and your Father. That was a revelatory statement. That, that was a radical thing to say to a first century Jewish person and especially a Jewish woman. Because women were looked down upon in that culture. You know, people like to say Christianity oppresses women. Nothing could be further from the truth. Christianity and the Bible elevated women to their proper place made in the image of God. So he says to this woman who was once possessed by many demons, I'm going to my God and your God. I'm going to my father and your father. Mary, guess what? He's your father now. You can call him father now. Not just me. We get the fact that Jesus calls God father. But now we can because of what he did. Now, <laughs> Calling God Father hits us in different ways because a lot of it depends on what kind of an earthly father you had, right? Uh, I never had a father really growing up, so when I thought of God as Father, I just had a big blank. Like, I don't even know what that is to have a father. Some of you uh, had fathers that were cold and distant. Others of you had fathers that maybe left you when you were young. Some of you may have even had fathers who were abusive and harsh with you. Or maybe incommunicative, but it was not a loving image of a father. But then others of you had a warm, loving, hands-on, involved dad. How many of you had a really good dad growing up? Oh, God bless you for that. How many of you did not have that experience? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay. So I understand what that's like. My wife, Kathy, uh, her father, Richard Martin, uh, just went to be with the Lord. Uh, we had the service for him here at church uh, just the other day. And he lived to be 95 years old. And he was a very, very good father. And I think because of that, when Kathy and her uh, three sisters and her brother heard the gospel, they, were, they very quickly embraced God as their father. They had such a great father figure. And so th this is this family that they lived in the Far East. Uh, Richard Martin was very educated, very smart guy, very successful guy. And uh, so there, this is a very cultured family, great manners. And then one day, Kathy brings me home to meet the parents. <laughs> I look like something the, dra the cat drug in, right? 
I had long hair past my shoulders, a thick red beard, you know, and like, here's my new boyfriend, dad, and I, he didn't take to me very well, but uh, nor did his wife, uh, Pilar. But um, so finally we decided we wanted to get married. And so I, I took a walk with him. I said, well, Mr. Martin, I, I want to marry your daughter. And I wanted to ask for your blessing. And he looked at me and said, <clears throat> well, no. Uh, this, he's very calm. No. No. And can I ask why, Mr. Martin? He said, well, you, you don't have a stable income. And, and uh, we're concerned about that and concerned for the welfare of our daughter. And I reassured him it'd be okay. And he said no again. But, uh, so, but ultimately, when we got married, he gave his daughter away. But an interesting experience happened. Um, when Kathy was younger, she is the middle daughter. She has her older sister, Mary, and then there was Dodie, and then there's Kathy, and then her younger sister, Jackie, and then finally her brother, Ricky. So, uh, so she had an uncle. This was the wife, excuse me, the brother of uh, Richard Martin's wife, Pilar, and he was not able to have children with his wife. And so he came to uh, Pilar, his sister, one day and said, you know, you already have two daughters. Now you have a third one. Can, can we just have your daughter? And um, interesting request. And so she said, let me talk to my husband about it. This shocked Kathy. Like, you went to talk to dad about this? Like, this was on the table? But fortunately, Richard, dad said no. And, uh, <laughs> but he eventually gave her away to me on our wedding day. And I'm thankful for that. But here's the good news. When you are a child of God, no one is going to take you out of his protective care. And we're afraid, oh, what if I lose my salvation? Oh, what if the devil gets me? Are you kidding me? You're a child of God. And Jesus said in John 10, 29, I will give them eternal life. They'll never perish. And no one can snatch them away from me. God is your shepherd. God is your father. And finally, he is your king. Because Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Notice he says, it's his good pleasure. I think sometimes we think of God as stingy. God doesn't want to give you that. God doesn't want to bless you. God wants to hold all the good stuff back and just kind of make your life hard. Nothing can be further from the truth. It's his pleasure to give to you the kingdom. But also when we think of God as king, it reminds us of the sovereignty and the power of God. So when you're filled with anxiety and fear and worry because of a problem you're facing, consider this, God is bigger than your problem. And if you have a big God, you have a relatively small problem. And if you have a big problem, do you realize how big your God actually is? That is why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then ultimately we get to the request, give us this day our daily bread. But effectively Christ is saying, when you pray, just contemplate the awesomeness and the greatness of God before you start firing off your petitions. It's okay to ask God for things. You should. It's okay to call out to the Lord for help. But remind yourself of the power, majesty, and greatness of God. And it puts your problems in perspective. Have you ever wondered why when you leave church, a lot of times you feel better than when you came in? The reason is, is because of amazing preaching. <laughs> by other pastors here at Harvest. No. I think the preaching plays into it. But I don't think it's any person. I think... What is it all about? I came in and what do I spend a good part of my doing, uh, time doing? Magnifying God. Magnifying God. And so as I'm thinking of God's glory and his power and I'm sort of casting my problems aside and I'm, I'm worshiping him, then I hear a message hopefully that reminds me of God's love and his sovereignty and his power and all those things I need to be reminded of. And I, I leave and now I have the same problems leaving that I had coming in, but all of a sudden I don't see them in the same way. It's all about perspective, isn't it? And so he's your king who's in control of your life. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. And they got in the boat, made their way across the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a massive freshwater lake. And uh, then a huge storm came 
and the waves were beating against their little boat, but Jesus was asleep. They woke him up and said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind stopped and the water was calm. And Jesus turned to them and said, Why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith? See, what they saw was Jesus had the power to stop nature's uh, havoc if he chose to. When he said, peace be still. And sometimes Jesus will come into the midst of your problem and say, stop, and it stops. And other times he's just with you as you face your problem. But I look at it this way. Better to be in a storm with Jesus than anywhere else without him. If Jesus is on board my boat, then I'm okay. And by the way, Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side. He didn't say, let's go out to the middle of the Sea of Galilee and I'll die. If he said that, I would not have gotten on that boat. He said, let's go to the other side. He did not promise them smooth sailing, but he did promise them a safe arrival. And the same is true for us. He has not promised you smooth sailing in life. But he has promised you a safe arrival. You will get to the other side. Well, I want to look at one last story. This is also on the Sea of Galilee. This is also about Jesus out there during a storm. But this one's a little different. It was a stormy night. And the disciples were on the boat. But uh, Jesus was not on board with them on that particular occasion. And then they turned and saw Jesus walking over the tops of those waves. And that brings us to Matthew 14, verse 27. Uh, if you haven't turned there yet, look at that. Matthew 14. Immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water. And when he saw, you might underline those two words, he saw the wind was boisterous. He was afraid. In beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. We'll stop there. So why did Peter sink? Because he was afraid. Fear makes us sink. We all know the feeling. Everything's going great. Then all of a sudden we're gripped with anxiety and fear. And we're practically drowning in our doubts. Faith gives way to fear. Trust to worry. And when faith reigns, fear has no place. But when fear reigns, faith is driven away. Why did Peter sink? Number one, because he took his eyes off of Jesus. Verse 30, he began to sink and he cried out. He was doing really well. I mean, let's give him some credit. You know, people critique Peter because he was so outspoken and said, honestly, some pretty crazy things. But there's a lot of ink given to Peter. He talked to Jesus and made many statements far more than any of the others in the gospel. So he had a lot to say. You always know where you stood with Peter. And, uh, but hey, he's the only guy that had the courage to actually try to walk on water. And Jesus actually said, come. And he came and of course he began to sink. He started to sink. Why? Well, he took his eyes off of Jesus. Years ago, we were in Hawaii and uh, Jonathan was much younger then. And he wanted to learn how to scuba dive. So I said, okay, well, let's put you through a little course. And the way it worked is they would train you for a day. And then you would go out for a dive the next day with a certified instructor. So I met the instructor and I said, well, I'm certified too. And he says, oh, good. You can come on the dive tomorrow. I said, good. And so Jonathan went through his whole day of training. And the next day came and it was kind of stormy. And all the boats were pitching out there on the water. And I was hoping they'd cancel the dive. And no, it was on still. So we... All got in the boat. Now the problem is I had not dove for quite a long time. And I was a little rusty. And I'm getting the equipment on. And you've got the weight belt. And you've got the regulator and the mask and the tanks and the fins and everything. you know. And, and, I'm, and you're sitting on a boat. And the way we were to get in is just fall backwards into the water. Which is the last thing you want to do when you have a bunch of weight attached to you. Right? And so I was, I was a little nervous because... I was hoping I would remember everything and I didn't like the way the water was moving around and uh, Jonathan looked pretty scared so I just didn't want to show him I was scared too because I'm certified, right? I'm supposed to be, you know, cool and calm. So, uh, so we go in the water 
and uh, we're under a bit, and, and it's even worse there. And I look over at Jonathan, and his eyes were as big as saucers. They were huge. He's totally panicking. And he's looking over at the instructor, and the instructor says to him, Jonathan, look at me. Jonathan, look at me. And then he says to Jonathan, remember your training. And I'm looking at the instructor too, going, okay, kids. <laughs> I don't know what the training was, but I'm looking at you. Are we gonna live through this? Well, everything was okay. But I thought that was pretty good advice. Look at me and remember your training. So when we're looking to Jesus, we can do crazy things, wonderful things, faith-filled things, seemingly impossible things. But when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we allow our minds and hearts to be filled with doubt, fear, and anxiety, we can start to sink just like Peter started to sink. But when that happens, here's what you need to do. Cry out to Jesus. Look at verse 30. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. There's nothing wrong with doing that. What is it that is in us that makes us say, well, I can, I can fix this. I can get through this. I can control this. Actually, maybe you can't. And really what you need to do is call out to the Lord. Oh, it's a sign of weakness. I actually think it's a sign of intelligence. I think it's a sign of stupidity to think you don't need God's help. I love what Jesus said, verse 31. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Peter's going down. He catches him pulling him up, and he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Interesting thing, this word, these words, little faith, is one word in the Greek, and there's sort of a tenderness to it. Oh, little faith, not two words, one, one word, oh, little faith, almost like a nickname. Oh, little faith. <laughs> Buddy, I know I named you Peter, and I know that means rock, and I know rocks sink. But hey, man, you were doing well. You were on a roll. Why did you doubt? Why did you take your eyes off of me? And then he lifts them up and they walk back to the boat. Maybe you're sinking right now. You're filled with fear and anxiety and worry. And you feel defeated. Maybe you're in the grip of some addiction. You say, oh, I can handle it. I've handled this before. And then you've fallen. You know, you've fallen off the wagon. And you're back in that same state again. You never thought you'd be there again. But there you are. And you're wondering, can I ever get out of this again? I feel like I'm sinking. It, it's the worst it's ever been. Or maybe there's somebody that has a marriage that's unraveling. You think, I don't think there's any hope for my marriage. Or there's somebody else that's dealing with some other problem. But you need to call out to the Lord. And remember that God is in control of your life. I love Romans 8, 28. I already mentioned it once. But I'd like to now mention the verse that follows it. 8.29. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also did predestine to be conformed into the image of his own dear son. So here's how it works. Something bad happens and we quote Romans 8.28. Well, all things work together for good. So no matter how bad it is, it's going to be good. That's not what the verse says. It says all things work together for good. It doesn't even say that God makes all things good because some things are bad. If you lose a loved one, that's bad. That's sad. That's hard. Well, it'll work together for good. No, God will bring good despite this tremendous loss. There's other hardships you maybe have faced and don't try to think that everything has to become good. God will bring good despite some of the bad things he allows in our life. But here's now the big picture. One day when I get to heaven, I may realize that those so-called bad things were maybe actually good things. I don't know that I could understand that, this side of heaven. But on the other side, I'll say, oh, I get it. You were using that to conform me into the image of your own dear son. You were using that to prepare me for something still in my future. And actually my loved one that died, and I felt so bad about that, they were in pure bliss and happiness. But I was suffering because I missed them. But now I see that you even had a purpose in that. There's a lot of mysteries. We're not going to figure out this side of heaven. So we just need to trust him 
until that day. But whatever you're going through can be turned around. I read an illustration used by Chuck Swindoll in a book that he wrote about a man that was shipwrecked on an uninhabited island. He painstakingly built a little hut for protection from the elements where he could keep the few items he had salvaged from the wreck. And for weeks he lived in this little hut and, uh, and he would shelter himself from the storms that would come and every day he would scan the horizon prayerfully hoping for someone to come and rescue him. And then he would go out for a while and search for food and come back to his little hut. And one day while he was out searching for food, he came back and was horrified to find his little hut where his few possessions were, was in flames. Now everything that he had was completely gone. He could not believe his bad fortune. And he fell asleep that night thinking how badly things had gone. Why would this happen? And then he awoke to the sound of someone's voice and it was the captain of a boat had just arrived and he said, we saw your smoke signal and we came to rescue you. So sometimes what we think is the worst disaster is a smoke signal leading to our deliverance. The worst case scenario can actually be exactly what the Lord has ordered for your life. There's one final movement in this story and I'll close. As Jesus is walking to them on the water in Mark's version, it says, and he would have walked right past them. I love that detail. It's like here they are freaking out in the water. They see Jesus walking and he doesn't even walk to them. He's just kind of walking by like, hey guys, how's it going? I'm Jesus, I'm just walking around on the water. Because when you're God, you can do stuff like this. It's amazing. And they're like, no, Lord, Lord, come on board our boat. We need you here. Oh, you want me to come? Yeah, we want you to come. Sure, here I come. And I think the reason Jesus did this is he won't force his way into anybody's life. You know, you have your problems right now. I don't want Jesus. Okay, he won't force his way into your life. Go ahead and deal with your troubles in your own way. Freak out, worry, be filled with anxiety. That's not gonna help. Turn to drugs, turn to drinking, turn to whatever it is you think is gonna fix it. That's not gonna help you. Or you can call out to him. But I'm telling you, the moment you call out to him, he will hear your prayer and he will answer your prayer. The Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And the verse that sums it all up is Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, and if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. How easily he could have said, I'm God, you're not. I'm kicking the door in, so get out of the way. By the way, have you ever tried to kick a door in? Uh, I did once. Uh, we were living in a little house in Riverside and we were locked out and we couldn't get in. And so I thought it would be a great idea to kick the door in. And I did after like 25 kicks and practically dislocating my leg. But John Wayne did it with one kick, right? So it, it's not so easy to do. He could have kicked his way in. He could force his way in. He says, hey, if you don't want me in your life, I won't come in your life. But if you want me in your life, I'll be there. I'll be there and I'll help you. And I wonder if there's somebody here that's sinking. Maybe you're sinking in addiction. You're sinking in despair. You're sinking in loneliness. You're sinking in anxiety. In reality, you're sinking in sin. And your only hope is Jesus. If you'll call out to him, he'll reach out and pull you out. But you have to ask for his help and call in his name. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago for you. Let me finish the verse I quoted earlier, John 14, where he says, the, and the way I go, you know, and where I'm going, you know. And Thomas said, we don't know the way you're going, and we don't know the way, we don't, know, we don't even know what you're talking about. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So now he's telling us how to come into a relationship with the Father through him and only through him. All roads don't lead to God. All religions don't pray to the same God as some would assert. No, we're calling on the true and living God and the only way to come to him is through Jesus. Why? Because only Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world. No guru did that. No prophet so-called did that. No other leader did that. But Jesus died for us and then he rose again from the dead and he's alive and he's with us here right now. 
And he'll come into your life and forgive you of your sin, but you must ask him to. In a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to extend an opportunity for you to believe in Jesus. An opportunity for you to ask him to come into your life. If you've not done that yet, why don't you do it? Right here, right now. Let's all pray together. Father, thank you for loving us so much. That you sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and laying your life down. And then rising again from the dead. Thank you that you're here ready to forgive sins for those that would call on you. Help those that need you to reach out to you now. Not while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying. How many of you would say tonight, I need Jesus. I need this relationship with God you've been talking about. I want to know God as my father. I, I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to find the meaning and purpose of my life. I'm ready to believe in Jesus now. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you will go to heaven when you die, would you just raise your hand up right now wherever you are? And I'd like to pray for you. God bless you. Raise your hand up however I can see it. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? You want God's forgiveness? God bless you up here in the front. Just raise your hand up. I'll pray for you tonight, wherever you are. God bless you. Anybody else? You want Christ to come into your life. You want to start this relationship with him. You want to go to heaven when you die. You know, we don't know when life will end. We may have many years ahead and we may not have so many years. We don't know what's going to happen in this crazy world of ours. The Bible says, prepare to meet your God. Because heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Are you prepared? Anybody else here? You need Jesus in your life? You want him to forgive you of your sin? If you haven't raised your hand yet, raise it now. Let me pray for you. Saying you want Jesus Christ in your life. I'll pray for you tonight. Just raise your hand up. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you there in the back. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Now I'm going to ask every one of you that raise your hand, if you would, please. I want you to stand to your feet, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Stand to your feet if you raise your hand, saying you wanted Jesus Christ in your life. Even if you did not, just stand up. You heard me right. Stand to your feet, and I'm going to lead you in this prayer. God bless you that are standing. There's a few more that need to stand, I think. Just stand up, and I'll lead you in this prayer of asking Jesus to come into your life. Anybody else, stand up now and we'll pray together. Even if you did not raise your hand, but you want him to forgive you of your sins, you want to start this relationship with him, stand up and we'll pray together. God bless you that are standing. I'll wait one more moment. There might be a few more of you. Stand now and then we'll pray. Anybody else, stand now. All right, God bless you. Yes, God bless you too. Anybody else? Don't be afraid. Only believe. That's what Jesus said. I love that. What are you afraid of? He loves you. You should be afraid of that life without him, not a life with him. He'll care for you and watch over you, forgive you of your sins and welcome you one day into heaven. God bless you. But you must come. You must call out to him. The disciples had to call to Jesus, and then he came. Will you call out to him? This is your moment. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. Let me lead you in this prayer. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now. God bless you. All right. I'm going to ask every one of you that stood, if you would please, to pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, as I pray, pray this prayer out loud after me. Just pray these words, Lord Jesus. I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and friend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you that prayed that prayer. Yes, that's right. God bless you.